Hi, so in the previous video we solved a Lagrangian where we maximized an individual's utility function and we derived the Euler equation and the intratemporal condition and that was as far as we got because we didn't use a specific utility function and so in this video we're going to actually come up with some utility functions so that we can actually get some conditions of our variables in terms of other variables and parameters. So use, using this general functional form that we did in the previous video, we don't know how consumption and labor actually enter into our model, so we can't say what consumption is equal to. So we're going to assume this utility function in which Again, we are positively depending on consumption and negatively depending on labor or positively depending on leisure, however you want to look at it. And we have some parameter here, gamma, that says that we weight our consumption and our consumption utility and our labor disutility by some constant, which we will often say is between zero and one. And we have seen functional forms similar to this before, where we have got this sort of one minus sigma functional form, and it looks kind of like an isoelastic function, where we have constant elasticity. And we choose this functional form because it simplifies things a lot for us in our calculations. And as you can see, this, this term, when we say differentiate with respect to consumption, is going to cancel out with our fraction on the bottom. So we assume this functional form of our utility function because it makes our life easier and we we can we can say that the this sort of utility function is a bit tractable tractable but coming up with utility functions that accurately represent a representative consumer is difficult so we like to simplify it so if we use this utility function and we differentiate it as we did in our euler equations and our intratemporal equations we can use our first order conditions to get out a number of equilibrium conditions in our economy. Now, so I'm not going to show all the differentiation of the utility function I just showed you and all the substitution and rearranging because that would just take absolutely ages. And so, and the, it, it was lots and lots of lines of working. So instead, I'm just gonna focus on the equilibrium conditions. We derive nine of these conditions and we can look at the household conditions. So these are the conditions that we derive from just directly from our Euler equations and our intratemporal equations because these are the household utility functions and the conditions we get. So we get a condition for our Euler equation and we've just differentiated. So this is what our equation for is. We have consumption in time t on the left hand side and consumption in time t plus one and this is obviously an expectation because we have t plus one, which is in the future. Remember, we are assuming that we're in time period t here. And we get a couple of other equations. So we get our trade-off between labor and consumption is equal to the wage rate. We showed that condition in the previous video as well. And we still have our household budget constraint. So these are the three equations we get out. Very, very simple to see how these were derived from our Euler equation and intertemporal condition and of course our budget constraint. We also get conditions for our firm. So if we remember that our, our production in our economy depends on the technology parameter Z, our capital stock and our labor stock. And so here in this equation number seven, we have just differentiated with respect to capital, hence why this is alpha minus one. So this term on the right hand side is going to be our marginal product of capital. And this is of course equal to our rental rate of capital because we're in a perfectly competitive with economy of flexible prices. And our wages are going to be equal to the marginal product of labor. And again, this is our production function with the derivative taken with respect to labor. So we have, we've have we changed the power on labor and we've dragged down this one minus alpha term. And we have our final condition number nine, which is just our production function. So maybe that should have been slightly higher. And that maybe should have been equation seven. And we saw how these two equations come from taking the derivative of this equation with respect to labor and capital. 
but this is fairly standard stuff we've seen we see a lot in economics and then we have three more equations which characterize our markets so we have our national income identity uh, we have our we have investment is equal to savings and this is our capital stock accumulation formula that we've looked at in the solar growth model and i mentioned in a previous video so we have uh, our capital stock in period t plus one is equal to investment plus the depreciated value of capital stock in period t but of course we've rearranged this such that investment is on the other side of the equation it's the same thing and we make this assumption that we have our aggregate level of la labor is equal to our individual choice of labor because we are using a representative individual and we've normalized the labor stock so there's our nine equations that we now have that characterize this economy in equilibrium so we've got the first three for the household which came from our first order conditions and these remaining six have come basically from our assumptions that we've made about this economy so we have eight endogenous variables we have consumption labor the rental rate of capital our capital stock wage rate the aggregate level of labor our aggregate level of output and our investment so eight endogenous variables and there's only one that's exogenous so our technology parameter z is completely outside of the model the model cannot change this parameter whereas these eight variables these all vary based on what the model says they do of course for many of them we have some initial level of capital stock and some population of labor in our economy that we start with but our model then says that these values changed based on how our exogenous variable changes and we do have nine equations above and only eight endogenous variables so this means that one of these equations is redundant and actually if we work through we will find that the household budget constraint is actually equivalent to our national income identity and this is just a result of the fact that we're aggregating from a representative consumer so our equation 10 here equation 10 is pretty much equivalent to our household budget constraint which is here our equation 6 and just by substituting things in we, we can show this but I, I won't I won't um, bore you with the details of that but if we want to solve this model we use eight equations and we can just get rid of equation 6 or equation 10 in order to do this so okay now that we we've got our equilibrium conditions that you just saw we we know that we can solve this model because we have eight equations with eight endogenous variables and so now we can look at the propagation mechanism of our model and what is the propagation mechanism well we said that we have some exogenous shock and our model is going to add add or retract from this shock so our exogenous variable that we're changing is zt and as we as we know from one of the equations we have seen we have that our output is given by our zt parameter multiplied by our capital stock and our labor stock or our labor supply and these are entering in in a sort of Cobb Douglas production function so if we have a shock to our zt say we increase our productivity parameter z well we're going to be directly increasing our yt just by increasing the right hand side of this equation we're going to increase the left hand side we have direct increase in output because we've increased productivity it makes sense so what our internal propagation mechanism is going to say that our model is going to give us an effect beyond this direct effect i've talked about propagation mechanisms a lot in previous videos and this propagation mechanism can be shown by using equation eight and i have written that down here just just to make this a bit simpler so this is what equation eight said it and I discussed it briefly that the wage rate is equal to the marginal product of labor so if we have this exogenous shock this increase in zt as here this is going to increase our marginal product of labor as we said this is marginal product of labor oops marginal product of labor and we're increasing z 
in, we're increasing productivity, so we're going to increase the marginal product of labor. It makes sense. And if we increase the marginal product of labor, what equation eight says is that we're going to increase the wage. So our labor is producing more for every unit it works. So in a perfectly competitive economy, which we are in, as we've assumed, this is going to increase the wage rate. And if we increase the wage rate, this is going to change the amount of labor that is supplied in this economy. And this is our propagation mechanism, because as we see, as I quickly wrote down this uh, equation of output in the economy, if we change this L term, we're going to change the output term. And so this is our propagation mechanism. We have an additional effect on output through the model. Um, I've put a change in labor here. I haven't said an increase in labor, and I didn't say a decrease in labor, because this depends on the income and substitution effect. And I've talked about this time and again in previous propagation mechanism videos, which just says that an increase in wage it could increase labor supply we're, because we are increasing the wage rate so people substitute um, their leisure time for labor time so they can earn more money and but we could also have that an increase in wage causes a decrease in labor supply through the income effect and people because an increase in wage means everyone gets richer for the units of labor they've already been working so as they're richer they want to have more leisure time so they want to substitute away from work so usually we will assume that we have this positive increase in labor because it seems more natural that we increase the wage rate. Um, so we're gonna increase the amount of labor that everyone supplies. And this tends to be what we notice for most people in reality, people who are on minimum wage, for example, if we increase their wages, they're gonna to tend to want to work more. Uh, and it's only our very rich people who want to decrease their labor supply when we increase their wage. So. And it also gives us a nicer propagation mechanism. So what, what we say if we assume that the substitution effect dominates that an increase in output through productivity shock is going to directly increase our output and then our propagation mechanism is going to increase our output further. And so that's our real business cycles. What it says if we make these assumptions that if we increase our, or if we get a positive productivity shock, we're going to increase our output by more than just the initial shock, the initial shock to productivity, and we have some persistence of this shock. It increases our output in future periods. Because a knock-on effect is that we also increase our marginal product of capital, and we we know that the marginal product of capital is just it's going to look very similar to this marginal product of labor that we have here, but we are differentiating with respect to capital, so we just have an alpha here. Uh, we have uh, something like this and um, yeah whatever but yeah so we're going to increase our marginal product of capital by having an increase in productivity and so this is also going to increase our investment in our economy and so an increase in investment is again going to have an increase in our output because we're going to increase our capital stock in future periods so we'll increase our we'll increase our y in time t plus one time t plus two and so on because we're increasing our future capital stock. So this is another propagation mechanism that we can have through our model that we're by increasing our productivity in just one time period, we can increase our labor to further increase the shock and we can increase our capital stock in many periods to come. And so this shock gives us a bit of persistence. So what we can actually do with some assumptions for example, that the substitution effect dominates, we can get that an increase in our uh, Z parameter, our technology parameter, can have a simultaneous increase in output, in labor, in consumption, and in investment. And this is what we tend to notice in the data. In real life, when we see positive shocks to our economy, we tend to notice that all these variables co-move in a positive way with each other. And so that's what real business cycles are kind of there to do, is to replicate the data. And it's very interesting that with such a simple model, we can get these results that, so, that resemble reality so well. Now, it does require some 
perhaps unrealistic assumptions as most economic models do and there's lots of criticism in the literature about this but this is a building block this is a very basic model we've just formulated so the, that's the general idea that we we are keeping a very simple model that allows us to solve it analytically and in the next video I will be showing a special case where we have full depreciation of capital and it means we can actually completely solve this just by doing a bit of algebra so make sure to check out the playlist for that video make sure to leave a like if this video was at all useful and to subscribe for lots of future videos